Okay, uh, good morning everyone and uh, welcome to the first session of today. Uh, so the first talk will be given by Yuan Li who comes to us from Peking University, China and his talk will be on topological magnet Dirac points in a 3D antiferromagnet. Thank you Chairman for the introduction. Can you hear me in the back? Um, yeah, um, I would like to begin by thanking the organizers, in particular uh, Gang and Subu, for the invitation and for putting together this very nice program and the hospitality. Um, so um, today I will be telling you about uh, our theoretical and also experimental investigation um, on uh, topological uh, magnets in a, in a 3D magnet. Um, before I start, I would like to thank my collaborators. So um, this work contains a theory part and experimental part, and both parts are actually done in close collaboration with my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Chen Fang's group at the IOP, uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences. And um, uh, Dr. Kang Kang Li, who, who has now uh, uh, joined uh, Hong Kong University as a, as a postdoc uh, and, and uh, undergraduate student, Chen Yuan Li, uh, uh, in my group, they are the, uh, the, the, uh, the main uh, people uh, for the theory part, and my two un uh, graduate students, uh, Wei Liang Yao and Li Chen Wang, uh, they did the experiment in collaboration with uh, uh, beamline scientists at the J Park facility, Kasuki Ida-san and uh, Kasuya Kamazawa-san. The funding come, came from uh, these sources. <clears throat> so um, this is an outline of my talk. Um, in order to motivate the research, I will tell you a little about my uh, uh, perspectives on uh, band topology and why we want to do it uh, for a magnetic system. And then um, uh, we will, we'll, I will give you some uh, general ideas about the uh, theoretical considerations, namely Z2 nodal lines and um, our limiting case, uh, which is a uh, um, direct point. And then tell you about our uh, neutron scattering experiment. And finally, I will uh, make a summary. So um, um, here I will be focusing mostly on uh, topological band crossing and um, to see, uh, to, to see uh, such structures in the band structure, um, the, uh, the simplest model perhaps is to, is to look at this Hamiltonian that leads to a wild point. So um, around the wild point you can, you can um, write down this Hamiltonian using Pauli and identity matrices um, with, a, uh, with, with this uh, coefficient that's just uh, proportional to the momentum distance from the, uh, the wild point. And when you diagonalize this two by two Hamiltonian matrix, then um, you, will, you, will, you, will, you will get this band structure and the horizontal axis is essentially just the distance between the wild point in any direction. Okay. And so here, the, the essential thing to have is just two bands in three dimensions and um, these wild points, uh, they can only be created and annihilated in pairs. And to see why we call it topological, um, of course, we can visualize um, uh, a wave function on a given momentum point by using this block sphere representation. So the wave function will correspond to a point on this block sphere. And then if you look at the wave functions on a, a constant energy uh, surface, namely here, and I'm ju now just moving these arrows on the block sphere to this momentum space um, sphere, which is the equal energy sphere, then you realize that actually the texture of the, of the wave function um, um, defines a map from momentum space to a Hilbert space. And actually this map covers the block sphere once and just once. Okay? And um, this is where the topology comes from because um, you, you might wonder whether I can open up a gap by introducing this uh, seemingly perturbative um, term, but actually that's not a perturbation because once you do that, the wave function texture uh, or the mapping from momentum space to block space uh, is actually uh, uh, very much different from, from what we started with. So um, this is very different from, from, from what we had just now because this map now contains a, a very big hole, so because a lot of uh, the block sphere is now missing, whereas the previous one is really uh, covering the whole block sphere at uh, once. So this um, difference is what um, defines the topology here. Okay. Now, um, topological bands have been uh, investigated a lot in uh, electronic systems, and starting from the uh, remarkable discovery of topological insulators, 
And then in recent years, the focus of the research has been shifted to uh, semi-metal systems, wild semi-metal and direct semi-metals. And typically, the, uh, the research evolves like it starts with some DFT calculation predicting such bands, um, and then followed by RPES, uh, perhaps sometimes STM experiments, to visualize these bands uh, both in the bulk and on the material surface. And so once uh, you see this, then you know that um, the, the, the calculation of the theory is confirmed. So this gives a, us an impression that electronic systems are actually a gold mine for uh, topological bands. But actually, the, the idea of band topology is, of course, uh, as we have already heard on, uh, from some of the tutorial talks, especially the one given by Gang um, last week, the idea of band topology is not restricted to, to uh, fermions or electrons in general. So there are, uh, in, the, in the early days, there are predictions of uh, photonic analogs of quantum hall and also uh, of uh, topological semimetals. And um, many of these uh, proposals have actually been realized in artificial structures like uh, uh, metamaterials showing a, a nice uh, wild point and also this mechanical system shows a topological uh, 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 vibration edge states. Okay. Now, uh, why do we want to uh, look for band topology in, uh, in magnetic systems, namely magnetic excitations? Um, I'm, uh, I'm trained from the field of uh, strongly correlated electrons and magnetism. So, so at, the, at the beginning, I thought that these, these uh, topological bands concerning non-interacting electrons is essentially not very much related to my own research. But then I, I realized that actually uh, for magnetic systems, um, there are some um, opportunities or some, some, uh, some ways to contribute to this field because band topology builds on symmetry and dimensionality. And if you think about three-dimensional materials, actually uh, magnetic uh, space groups are much richer than crystallographic ones. So um, um, especially in the context of topological crystalline insulators for electronic systems, um, they're using a lot, many uh, so-called uh, non-symorphic groups here, and uh, when you consider magnetic groups, there are counterparts of that. Now, <clears throat> the second reason to consider magnetism for band topology is that there is the so-called uh, uh, bulk surface correspondence principle. Uh, namely, when you have a topological band in the bulk, then the surface or interface uh, would be special. And uh, magnetism is useful in that sense because it supports uh, spintronics or some kind, sometimes called magne magnetic. Um, application, which are essentially using material surface or interfaces um, as the device. And so uh, when we have a, a magnetic material, topological, then this could, 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 be, could be possible. And the third reason, perhaps is the most relevant context to this conference, is that uh, when we think about, for instance, spin liquids or also spin uh, uh, skirmion structures, um, we, uh, we, we have topology in real space, whereas band topology um, is mainly about uh, reciprocal space. Now, how to connect these two? I think it will pose an important question for all, all of us. Now, uh, we are not the first ones to think about uh, 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 topology in magnetic systems, so there are uh, very nice proposals. Um, uh, first, about uh, uh, magnon uh, topological insulators, and this example uh, is actually proposed by Garnish. Uh, at this conference um, and, and back in 2015. And also in Gang's talk uh, uh, last week, uh, you have already heard about this uh, example of topological uh, semi-metal in the form of a wild point. And, um, and there are also experimental realizations. And um, so this pioneering work by uh, Young Lee's group uh, back then at MIT and also this more recent study in the Swiss Tree Sutherland uh, 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 system. Um, these are nice demonstration um, of topological uh, or bosonic uh, topological insulators. Uh, and and uh, what I will be telling you about today is a semi-metal state, of course. And um, so there's a big difference between uh, measuring a, a, a topological insulator state and a semi-metal state in the sense that these neutron scattering experiments, they are mainly detecting the bulk. And when you have a topological insulator, or, uh, or magnon counterpart of that, um, the experimental observation is essentially these gaps. 
And so whether these gaps are topological or you need a theory to calculate, for instance, the churn number, whereas for semi-metal, as you will see, we, we, we can observe the topological structure um, directly in the bulk. And also um, these experiments require the application of a, a moderate magnetic field, whereas our experiment is in zero field. Perhaps you will hear about some of the uh, more recent development from the next speaker um, also um, in, in, in this, in this uh, uh, context. Okay, now um, let me tell you a little about our theoretical consideration. And what I just show you as an example for the wild point is uh, this Hamiltonian. Uh, it contains, uh, you can construct it uh, with uh, three Pauli matrices. And now uh, when you further uh, uh, put on the constraint uh, that uh, the system has a PT symmetry, and especially PT square equal to plus one, then you can make the Hamiltonian real, so you can get rid of sigma y, and then you no longer have uh, three coefficients to go to zero in order to have the band crossing. You only have two coefficients. If they, go to, if they both go to zero, then you will have a band crossing. And in three-dimensional momentum space, you have three free parameters, momenta, and only two equations to satisfy, so that generally the solution will take the form of a one-dimensional object for the nodal line. And uh, our collaborator, Chen Fang, back in uh, 2015 in this paper, they discovered that when you think about all kinds of nodal lines in three-dimensional uh, structure, so here they are used, using the homotopy group language, which I know nothing about, but the, 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 the claim is that um, there are actually uh, two types of nodal lines um, in, 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 in this, in this uh, case. The first type um, has uh, topological invariant called the barrier phase, um, in the sense that when you look at the wave function structure on a closed loop in, uh, in, in momentum space, sometimes you will notice that there is something special going on with the wave function on this closed uh, loop. Then you know that actually there must be something pen interpenetrating with, it, with that, and that's the nodal line. Okay. What they found new back then was that there is another type of nodal line that in addition to this topological invariant, it can also be detected by looking at the wave function structure on a closed sphere in three-dimensional momentum space. And when you detect something special on this closed surface, then the nodal line inside is like a, is like a source of topology or, like, or some topological charge. And this, they call, this, it turns out that both of them are, are Z2 topological invariants. And so this is very abstract, so let me just show you some concrete example to see the difference between um, the, the regular or type one nodal line and the, the new type two nodal line. And here, uh, these are the Hamiltonians, and I'm playing with these uh, coefficients, and it's displayed in these figures. So uh, for type one nodal line, by continuously changing this M parameter, you will be able to shrink this nodal line in momentum space to a single point. And then if you go further, the two bands will no longer touch each other. Now, um, so in, in a way, there is a, you, can, you, can, uh, you can remove um, type 1 nodal line gradually by shrinking it. And, uh, but for type 2 nodal line, actually, this is not possible. You can change your parameters to make it shrink to a, to a, to a single point onto, or to a line segment, which is a lower dimensional object. But if you go further, it will expand out again. And so, um, and here I'm plotting for you the, the crossing uh, trajectory between the red and the, and the blue bands. Yeah, so no matter what you do to these parameters, it's, all, it's always there. Which is, uh, which is an intuitive consequence because if you have a topological invariant in the sense of a, a point source, then um, simply by contradicting uh, uh, argument, if you were able to remove it completely, then this topology will suddenly change and that's not possible. So it turns out that um, um, uh, there are plenty of examples in electronic systems showing uh, these kinds of uh, type 1 nodal line, but um, so far until today, there is no uh, uh, realization of type 2 um, nodal line in electronic systems. So um, we realized that actually maybe it's more convenient to realize type 2 nodal line from uh, magnetic excitations. And the idea we had is uh, by appreciating the fact that uh, type 2 nodal line is like a hybrid between a type 1 nodal line 
and a while point. It's hybrid with a while point because it, it, it gives the essence of a, a point charge in, uh, inside this closed sphere. So how do we construct this? We, 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 we then philosophically, we thought about the idea of um, how uh, topological properties can get uh, inherited yeah, um, from, from something else. And this is just a, a, a schematic example. It's in real space. So um, if you take a, a piece of paper and glue the two ends together to form a Mobius band, then this, this object, of course, it contains a, a non-trivial topology. Now, these two are actually uh, following this object by cutting, cutting this band along its middle line, just using a scissor. You can do the experiment at home. By doing it once, you will get this twisted band. And if you do it again with this object, by cutting it in, in the, along the, its middle line, you will get two interpenetrating or entangled uh, and both twisted bands. So it seems that once you start with something topological, then by, by removing some of its uh, requirements or symmetries, then uh, you can get something else. So, uh, so that's the strategy we, we, we used. We start with something like a wild point and a direct point. Uh, in our case, I as I will show you in a minute. So we start with this in the Magnon band structure, and then we remove some of its required symmetries to, 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 to make it a nodal line. And then, then the nodal line we obtain will be uh, the type 2 nodal line uh, with the essence of a wild point. And um, the way how we do it is to consider um, uh, PT symmetry, which is uh, time reversal followed by space inversion symmetry, plus uh, U1 spin rotational symmetry. This is our starting point to have wild points. And then we remove U1 symmetry, uh, leave, uh, leaving us just with PT. That would give us the type 2 nodal line. And here, this graph, I'm sure you, most of you would, would know about already, but uh, it's just a, a, a schematic uh, drawing to show you when we consider the system to have PT and U1. So when, when the material structure has an inversion center, then, uh, which is shown by the red point here, then if you do an inversion times uh, time reversal, then this spin pattern will remain intact. And also, you can turn all the spins along the vertical axis on this graph, and nothing will change. So this, this has both PT and U1. This is a ferromagnetic situation. In that case, you don't have PT symmetry, because it, it, yeah, all the spins will be reversed. And um, this is a non-collinear uh, magnetic structure. In this case, uh, we still have PT, but we don't have U1 symmetry. So um, if we manage to go from here to here, then we will, we will uh, and, and if we are able to get a wild point here, then the, that wild point will become a nodal line um, in this situation. But um, simply for uh, the experimental reason, today I will be mostly uh, focusing on, on this part, and only at the end of my talk I will attempt to go from here to here. Now, um, turns out that when the system has both PT and U1 symmetry, it's almost uh, I mean, theoretically trivial to, 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 to realize that there will be wild points. The reason is that when you do a spin wave theory starting from an uh, ordered antiferromagnetic ground state, you realize that the U1 symmetry would, would, uh, would make sure that in all the excitations, the, uh, the SZ, total SZ quantum number um, along the quantization axis will, will, will be conserved. And so, um, uh, when you write down this, um, this spin wave Hamiltonian for any generic K point um, in, in momentum space, this Hamiltonian will be automatically block diagonalized because, because uh, you cannot have, for instance, you cannot have A dagger, A dagger, because that would change the total SZ quantum number by, by, plus, uh, by plus two, which is not allowed. And so, this block diagonalized form is very helpful. Because then, on top of that, if you impose PT invariance, you realize that these two blocks are the same apart from a complex conjugate. So when you solve this Hamiltonian for a generic k-point, um, the solution for this block, the, 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 the energy spectrum, will be exactly the same as, as this one. And now that we have already used up all our symmetry, so within each block, it will be a, it will be a, a three-dimensional uh, ham, uh, momentum space a Hamiltonian. And if there are two bands very close to each other, 
then that would return to the case which I show as an example at the very beginning. Then they could cross, and the crossing point we will uh, have the form of a while point. And of course, there will be a while point here and also a while point here because the energy spectrum will be exactly the same. So the two together, it turns out that they will have opposite monopole charges for the while point. And so in total, it will make a direct point. Yes? That's right. Yes? That's right, yeah, so you, you, instead of diagonalizing this directly, you need to have the plus one, minus one Hamiltonian, I mean, matrix to, to yeah, this we consider that, yeah. It's not so obvious, but once you go through that, you, this, this is the outcome, yes. Yeah, thanks for the question. Actually, I, I, I skipped a little detail here, yes. Yeah, so, so yeah, uh, so from this you can see that um, uh, generally when there are band crossing uh, behaviors, then it will take the form of a, a direct point, uh, and, and it's actually a wild point in each block. And um, the, uh, the block diagonalized form prevents these two wild points with opposite charges to annihilate each other. That's why these direct points can be stable. And even though they are direct points, actually they are not the same as typical direct points we have for uh, electronic system because in essence, it's, it is really like a wild point. So it can appear anywhere in the brilliant zone, always in pairs, and it will have uh, surface arc states, just like uh, wild semi-metals. But of course, in the bosonic uh, spectrum, and in a way, uh, those excitation states are, are empty uh, when you are uh, cool enough, cold enough. So um, um, then on the material side, the requirement is just this symmetry, plus the fact that the magnetic primitive cell must have multiple spins so that you have multiple uh, magnon bands to cross into each other. And with this in mind, we actually, uh, we were, we actually were very greedy because we, we then hunt for material with many spins in the primitive cell. In this case, actually 12 uh, copper spins um, in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in the magnetic primitive cell. So this material was, uh, was, uh, was discovered a long time ago. It has a three-dimensional uh, nail temperature of around 60 watt. 61 Kelvin, excuse me, and uh, space group is, uh, it belongs to a cubic uh, crystal system, 206, and um, uh, it's a body center system, so this box actually contains 24 uh, copper spins, and actually the primitive cell contains uh, 12. Okay. Now, this is a magnetic sublattice uh, uh, of this material. Every sphere here indicates a copper atom, and uh, the two colors indicate uh, uh, spin up and spin down. Now, um, they can be organized into this way by uh, drawing uh, nearest neighbor interactions, and um, um, every copper is shared by and only by two hexagons. And, and of course, uh, these hexagons are approximately perpendicular to a body diagonal, and there are four body diagonals, so four pairs of hexagons. Now, um, um, just to demonstrate that the general theoretical consideration is correct, we, we then plug in this toy model with J1 and J2 interaction, and we play with J2 over J1 ratio over a wide range, and we always get um, this kind of uh, band crossing. It's very stable. And you can also look at uh, surface states, um, and yeah, indeed, they, they have uh, arc-like uh, surface states. Now, it turns out that the high uh, space group symmetry of this system also allows us to mathematically prove that the brilliant zone P point will always be a, a direct point by using this uh, Clifford algebra. I, wouldn't, I won't have time to go into detail of that, but the, just to remember, the P point will always be a direct point. And that's experimentally very convenient because then we know where to look at. And finally, um, we actually know that U1 symmetry is not strictly uh, there in this system because we know the material will have jaroshinsky moria interaction, making the magnetic structure slightly non-collinear. So um, um, the general expectation is that um, when you, you, you look at the reality of this material by introducing jaroshinsky moria interaction, then the nodal, uh, sorry, the, the direct point will expand out into a nodal line, either in the form of a loop or in the form of a line segment. Uh, um, with symmetry consideration, they will look like this. So, so far, that's all I need to tell you uh, why we, we, we decide to, uh, to look at this uh, from 
from an experimental point of view because there is a concrete theoretical prediction. And, um, and, um, but actually, when we think about doing the experiment, the situation is not so straightforward because for this audience, I guess I don't have to repeat this, but uh, generally speaking, for spin half with, uh, with antiferromagnetic interaction, actually, long range magnetic order is not the only possible outcome. Can, they can also be organized into singlet forms, and, um, and the singlet form locally has a much better energy than antiferromagnetic arrangement. Only by having many neighbors would you be able to stabilize a narrow order. Yeah? So when n is much bigger than 3, then the, 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 the narrow um, order, or semi-classical order, would be stable. And actually, for instance, if we, if we think about um, cubic lattice, then this crossover from quantum situation to classical situation would happen somewhere between uh, one and two dimensions or, or two, two and four neighbors. And now, for our system, if only J1, or the nearest neighbor interaction, is there, even though the lattice is 3D, actually the number of neighbors is only four. And that's a pretty bad situation for us because this graph, you have seen it many times, it's a, it's a parent compound for high TC cuprate. Seemingly, there is a nice spin wave, but if you look at the optical or the high energy part of these magnons, actually, it is not very clear. And even in this case, it's also a 2D Heisenberg model uh, for this compound. Actually, close to the zone boundary, the, you cannot really see a, a harmonic a magnon excitation. And our uh, wild points or direct points actually live in the optical branches, if you remember uh, from the earlier slides. So, if it turned out to, to, to be difficult to, to resolve this part of the magnon, then it's very bad news for us. And so um, our experiment was done with an inelastic neutron scattering, and uh, I believe uh, Yingjie has already given us a very nice tutorial talk last week about it, so I wouldn't go into detail of that. But essentially, at the end of the day, we measure this SQ omega uh, uh, quantity, um, which can be directly calculated uh, um, from, from, from theory. And um, the way how we measure it is by using the so-called time-of-flight method, which is a modern fashion of doing inelastic neutron scattering. And let me walk you through that a little bit. So um, on this four-season spectrometer at J-Park facility in Japan, um, we essentially hit the sample, a single crystal sample, with pulses of monochromated neutron beam, so a single energy in pulse. And, um, after the sample, there is this huge wall of detector. There are many pixels installed in this detector array, and every pixel knows where it is, and it, it will be able to time how, how, how long it takes from the neutron to travel to the sample, hit the sample, and then travel to the detector. So by uh, using this time and position information, um, um, the, the, the instrument will be able to tell us how much energy is transferred to the, to the, to the uh, uh, material and also how much momentum is transferred. So if you simply count the number of three parameters, so time delay, time delay is one parameter and the detector um, location is the X and Y parameter. And on top of that, if you further rotate the sample, that's a total of four free parameters in the experiment. And by using these four parameters, you will be able to invert to this um, SQ omega function, which also has four variables. So um, this is a very efficient and, 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 and powerful technique to detect the band structure uh, in, 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 in three-dimensional materials. And this is an example of visualizing phonons in this curious uh, material. Okay. Now, um, it turns out that there's uh, one more big advantage from the material side, which is, that, which is uh, cubic symmetry. So with cubic symmetry, when we have a continuous coverage in three-dimensional momentum space, we can actually fold the data into this physically independent sector, which in volume is only 1 over 48 of the initial data package. So by doing this, um, this greatly enhances the statistical accuracy. And this is done with uh, the, uh, the time-of-flight neutron software package Horus developed at the ISIS facility. And once you do that, you can make many, you can realize that your data contains many brilliant zones, and then you can make high symmetry cuts, just like how you would like to visualize your band structure calculation. And by looking at these cuts, then the dispersion and the intensity distribution, distribution can be overdetermined. So um, to do the experiment, we, we use these single crystals uh, array, and it has a mosaic spread 
pretty small, about two degrees, and a sharp transition at the temperature where things are supposed to happen. And um, these are raw experimental data taken in the order state and just 12 Kelvin above the nail temperature. And you can see that all these very nice harmonic uh, spin waves have disappeared um, um, slightly above the transition temperature. And this is a very 3D transition. And despite this huge change, actually the inelastic spectral weight is more or less conserved. This is, a, this is very different from the situation here because up to the zone boundary and up to the highest energy, we can really observe the, the magnon bands very clearly. So we started to wonder why. So how come that with this connection of four neighbors in total, how come that is so harmonic? And just to tell you the answer quickly, um, it turns out that the true spin network contains another very strong interaction, which is between the ninth uh, nearest neighbor, which is a little bit surprising. But it turns out that the, the, the reason is in the bond angle. So um, for, for J1, for instance, despite the close distance actually from copper to oxygen and back to copper, this angle is pretty bad. It's between ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic situation. So the interaction is not very strong, whereas this one, despite the, the distance and the fact that there are two oxygens sitting in between, it's a very straight bond. Yeah. So I will come back to this later. So um, with these uh, neutron data, then we are able to, to do an extensive spin wave fitting. And um, it turns out that because the data are so extensive, then to avoid a local minimum problem, we have to do it in two steps. In the first step, we just attempt to fit the dispersions. And um, um, we tried many recipes, and it turns out that we need to consider interactions up to J9 in order to get a good fit. And uh, so these are the data, and the best fit in terms of just the dispersion uh, looks like this. Yeah, so it goes through more or less the data center. Now, once we get this result, um, then we start from these parameters as a starting parameters, and then in the second step, we become more ambitious, and we try to fit the total intensity pattern. And to do that, we need to consider domain average for the um, antiferromagnetic domains, and we also need to introduce one more um, parameter, which is the, uh, the moment size, which accounts for the scattering intensity. Now, uh, after we do that, this is measurement data and this is calculation from spin wave theory. And it's in, both are in absolute units, so it's an absolute cross-section unit. And um, for the same small Q trajectory, but in three different Boolean zones. Yeah? And the agreement is really nice. And so upon seeing this, we, we know that the, the model really works. And uh, um, then, then we know that there's a chance to use this model to, to guide us in the search of topological band structure. And just to tell you how good it works, then I'm showing you more conventional cuts. So constant momentum, intensity versus energy cuts, and, and at many different positions. And the fit globally works very nice. And it turns out that the moment size here is much bigger than the case in in, in the high TC Cooper parent compound, which is another indication that um, the, the magnetic or the magnetism is very classical. Now, um, this is the table for, for all the interactions, and it turns out that only J1 and J9 are very big, and everything in between is much smaller. And, um, and, and, and you can, as you can see from the bond angle, that, yeah, only this one is a very straight bond, and everything uh, here involves at least one angle, which is close to 100 degree. And that's why all these interactions are, are not so strong. And our result is very recently uh, supported also by DFT calculations uh, done by Nanjing University group led by Professor Shen Gang Wan. And, um, and they have been collaborating with another experimental group from Nanjing University working on the same material. But back then, their model um, uh, uh, did not consider the presence of J9. And actually, this is DFT calculation. And indeed, the, the large value of J9 is supported. Um, and this is our experimental value. So uh, yeah, so using that DFT result to directly calculate the spin waves, and sorry, and this is what they get. So it looks pretty much similar to what we had. Uh, so with this uh, knowledge about the theory, then we know where the, 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 the band crossing would be. It is at the P point, of course, but then we know where to look for. And it turns out that uh, this particular P point, the fonts are too small, but it's a 
1.5, 0.5, 1.5, this particular P point, then we have a large volume of four dimensional data library around it. And then by combining all these, and uh, we can get this uh, band dispersion uh, image, which goes in energy in 0.2 MeV steps. So it's very finely spaced in energy. And this direct cone is directly seen. And if you prefer the more conventional way of plotting the data, then this is what you get. So um, here I'm making a symmetric walk um, from away the, from the p-point to, to the p-point, which is shown in red here, and then away from it again. And so um, the dispersion will have to be symmetric uh, uh, in momentum space. So this is, this is five minutes left. Yes, good. Yeah, so, so um, you can see this X shape in the dispersion. Now, uh, we can also uh, go further by checking the intensity pattern around this direct point by looking at the SQ Omega detail structure, and this is experimental data with a dispersion like this. And let's just focus on this one. And this is the calculation. So it looks very much similar. In particular, this cut is chosen such that here is an H point, here's another H point, so it's a symmetric. But the intensity pattern is, of course, SQ Omega is not symmetric, and this envelope shape is nicely reproduced um, in the experiment compared to the theory. And we can do this also for other cuts, so uh, I won't bother you with further details, but it always agrees between experiment and, 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 and theory. And this is another cut from P to a, to a random point in, in, in the middle of the brilliant zone, and this experiment, and this is, this is calculation. So with that, I hope I have convinced you that the direct points are confirmed. And let me go back to the point whether it's really a direct point or, or a nodal line. But, but, but for that, we need to check whether U1 symmetry is present or not. And um, this can be done by looking at the bottom of the magnon dispersion, because here we are, we are a spin half system, which uh, cannot allow a single ion and isotropy. And here we, we do see a finite gap yeah, at the bottom of the spin waves. So we believe that this gap is most naturally explained by, uh, by the presence of, uh, by the presence of uh, uh, jarosinski moria interaction in the system. And so that would generally tell us that the moments should be slightly counted away from each other, not exactly collinear. And despite the fact that we are not able to resolve these tiny loops, we believe that actually all the direct points we are seeing are actually uh, nodal lines. So with that, let me summarize my talk. Um, I have told you about uh, a theoretical consideration about uh, a new type of nodal lines with Z2 monopole charge. And, and uh, we believe that it can be found in a large class of PT symmetric uh, antiferromagnets. Then on top of that, if you add U1 symmetry, then we have, uh, we have a way of getting direct points as the limiting case. And now it is experimentally confirmed for this particular material. And um, there is a pleasant surprise in the sense that it suppresses uh, quantum fluctuation because uh, long-range super-super exchange interaction J9 is present in our system. And um, so uh, as an out outlook, um, it means that Similar things can be done in a lot of materials, uh, and, 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 and to do a good neutron scattering experiment, of course, a higher symmetry material would be desirable. And if you are really after seeing a ring, a nodal ring, then it means that we need very large uh, U1 symmetry breaking uh, uh, interaction, such as jarosinski moria interaction, because the nodal ring diameter would be proportional to the square of it. And um, we have collaborators working on uh, speedtronics uh, on this material, and we ourselves are also trying um, or, or to explore, exploring ideas how to observe the magnon surface states. This is work in progress. And finally, I would also like to indicate to you that actually neutron scattering is not only good for visualizing magnons, but also phonons, and this is our most recent work in progress in Cobalt uh, City Site. And there, there is uh, also a direct point like uh, band crossing proposed in theory, and we have sort of confirmed it in the experiments. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Questions for the speaker? Uh, is there an understanding of what, what is the nature of the transition when your system 
uh, when the nodal lines come together and forms a single Dirac cone, so it forms a cone which caps out. So, you have um, this so in our system, it does not become gapped out because it's uh, because it, uh, the nodal line contains a, a Z2 monopole charge. Um, so in our case, we know how to make it a single point. That's by uh, that's by imposing the U1 symmetry. And but if you that, 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 there's there's only a way to impose U1 symmetry, and once you remove it, it will become a nodal line again. So it, it does not become gapped out. Yeah, but so that's the that's one difference between our nodal line and uh, the more like usual ones. Any questions? So I had a question. So I perhaps missed it. Uh, uh, you said that in your system the uh, Dirac point is at the high symmetry point P, right? Yes. But in your introduction, you said that it need not be. So what was? Wait, yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Yeah. So so um, indeed, um, if you let me let me try to show. Indeed, um, we can. We, so uh, for the convenience of having a, a space group two hundred six, yeah. Um, the p-point will always be such a direct point, but the general theory tells us that it's not really pinned to a high-symmetry point. So in a way, you can view this as the, p the direct point at the p-point gives you a charge to start with. In order to balance that monopole charge, you need something else somewhere, somewhere else in, in, in the brilliant room. For instance, you can see that um, down here. This one, it turns out that it's, it's, it's close to here, so it's very hard to see. But this one, there is a direct point here, but very close to it, there is another one. So um, yeah, so, so this is like an additional bonus from this system that you not only know that there will be uh, direct points at general momenta, but also at high symmetry points. So we are, we, are, we are taking the high symmetry points as a convenience experimental handle. I see. Thank you. Uh, any questions? OK, if not, let's thank the speaker again.